repeat a little bit about society. Yeah, so here you are out in the woods on an island off the coast of Washington State. You and your dog and nothing to do and no place to go. And congratulations for that. That's enough of meditation. Thank and you. St starting to watch the mind now is basically all we've got left to do because there's nothing much left to do once we leave away and say, um, actually, we can talk about it like this. When I was, uh, when Danny was in Thailand, this, the idea was that when you're in Thailand, only have thoughts of, of being on in Thailand, not have sure. thoughts about England. That sure. you're not in England, don't think about England. So now that you're on the island, you can have thoughts about the island and what's happening on the island. Sure. And don't have thoughts about other place, someplace else. Sure. That in fact, the be here now, uh, being here almost requires the now. But what happens is, is that uh, when we're thinking about someplace else, even, you know, in abstract time, no particular time with it, but when we're thinking about New York or Chicago or whatever, Miami Dolphins, it doesn't matter what we're thinking about. We're not thinking about right here, right now. Yeah, I actually had a great moment that reminded me of that today. I mean, the whole day was, was that basically, but there was one moment in particular. Uh, so I was walking along the beach with Rocky and, uh, and there's this nice couple sitting uh, right next to the water and he went up to say hi to them. He's a very friendly dog. And, um, and they said, hi, you know, et cetera. And I went, and I went over to say hi and, and they were looking at this rock and it was a rock that it was actually a piece of wood, but it looked a lot like a rock. And they were just commenting on this piece of wood. They were so interested in this piece of wood and why it was the way it was. We just talked about it for a few minutes. And then I went on my day and I was like, you know what? These people just really wanted, cared about this piece of wood. Like that was what they cared about, you know, and like I was thinking back in my New York life, you know, like uh, it would be I'd be thinking about this person and that person and this event and all this, these uh, these complications, this and that, you know, whatever need to do this, et cetera. But these people are just thinking about this piece of wood. You know, it's beautiful. That's great. You know, yes. And here that piece of wood is in the here now. Rather yeah, yeah, it was right there. About other places, other people, other times. Well, yeah. our society teaches us to do that. Yes. Um, there is all kinds of stuff, including the sign, plan ahead, where the sign didn't have enough room for the D. Plan ahead. Yeah, you've seen those signs, plan ahead. Actually... Yeah. That's not the point. That's missing the point in a way, because a, a, a better way of doing that, instead of writing the word plan ahead, they should be writing down, watch what you're doing. Mm. Or look at what you're doing, because if you look at what you're doing, then you'll have the letter spaced right. Sure. Okay, so we're uh, we're talking about Planning ahead actually is quite dangerous. All right. Another way of thinking, though, is to be prepared. Being prepared mm. is not the same as planning ahead. Mm. Sure. And it is a very, very good idea to plan, uh, excuse me, to be prepared, because if you're prepared, then you're prepared for anything. Sure. To where when you plan ahead, then that means that everything has to go to plan or you've got a disaster because you didn't you weren't prepared. Sure. So I, I have a comment slash question about that related to meditation. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of things. So and also being in nature. So one comment about being in nature 
is I've noticed that oftentimes when I'm in nature, the solutions to my problems emerge very spontaneously. Like just, it's like it comes from the woods almost. And I know it's my own mind, obviously, but like, you know, it, it's like, I'll just be thinking and it's, Oh, that, you know, it just comes up and it's like, Oh, that's the solution. <laughs> You know, it's really beautiful. I don't know why well, that is, but I notice when I'm in nature. Actually, that's yeah. the solution, is a second thought. Yes, yes. That's the follow-on thought, that's trying to make those connections. The point is, is that there never was a problem. There was only an idea. Sure. Sure. And now we're trying to make that idea a solution to a problem. Where in fact, no, it's just a good idea. Sure. And then another thing, too, related to this is I've noticed when I do a long sit, um, my mind will naturally drift into, uh, you know, whatever it is I have going on in my life. You know, like, oh, this girl or this job or whatever, you know. And... Um, and I'll often find that I figure out the solution, you know, in meditation. Mm -hmm. And and I figure and I'm really happy about that. And I'm like, oh, I figured that I had that today. I figured out something that was uh, important to me. And I was like, oh, I figured that out. That was great. You know, that I feel great now that I figure that out. But I think it's actually one step beyond that to just not even go there and just be happy the whole time. But okay. nonetheless, I do really enjoy finding the solutions to these problems. And I know when I do longer sit, sometimes it's an opportunity for me to do that. And so I, I use the sit a little bit in that way. But I figure out a lot of stuff. And and just one last little story here. You will you might like this. One time I had a... Just hang on. A, just hang on. Keep yeah. it for a minute. Okay. We have to look at... This issue is, is that you told yourself something. You One, you had a thought or an idea. And then you told yourself something about how good that idea was. And then you felt good. Look at that. Whether or not that idea that you had is right, wholesome, beautiful, beneficial, we don't know at that moment. Sure. And that, in fact, at a later time you go to apply that, you may find that it didn't work. Sure. All right. That happens quite a lot, that people will have brilliant ideas. They're hopping up and down inside for joy that they finally figured it out. And right. then they feel good and content. All right. And then on another day at a later time or something, they go and they apply that idea that they had and it didn't work. Yeah, totally. But that does not prevent them from having that aha moment. So what we need to look at is, is that stop looking for ideas that seem to be solutions to uh, a problem and start looking for the fact that you can give yourself those ahas. Sure. This is a slight different change of it, but one of them is, is that something happened and an idea. Number two, what we're talking about is, is caveat diem. Sure. To seize the day. Sure. Or to seize the moment, in fact. And so that aha that we have, that we feel so satisfied with, is actually an internal feeling, but it does not have to come from a brilliant idea other than perhaps the brilliant idea that we need to have is, well, I could feel really good right now. Sure. So that's a so, brilliant idea is, is that there are no problems. I've solved them all. <laughs> not just I solved one problem, <laughs> but I've solved all the problems. That's the idea. That's a grand <laughs> idea. And then we can get really wow over that. Yeah, that is a grand idea, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad Very I'm grand. able to say, yeah, I'm trying to get that grand to you. This is part of the yeah. teaching, right, is, is that if you have an idea that makes you feel really, really good because it's a solution to a particular uh, problem or something, and you get a really wow and a really good feeling for that, then have this idea, you got no problems. 
right? Now that's an idea. No problems. They're all solved. Every single one of them is now defunct. It was automatically sure. uh, the solution has been already applied. And it well, I, I, no. <laughs> I, I really hear you 100 percent, but I, I have to also say, you know, maybe call us devil's advocate or whatever. But, I, you know, I sometimes have really good ideas, you know, in meditation, you know, like okay. they just come up like and I'm really happy when that happens, you know, like, every like time stuff have a happy. Right, become happy. That's yeah. the whole point. Mm. Now, but instead of having happy, a whole bunch of different, huh? Can I be happy and still come up with the ideas at the same time? You don't need any ideas to be happy. It's the happiness does, is not dependent upon the ideas. I, I get that, but I still like the ideas. <laughs> I know, <laughs> and liking leads to clinging, and then when you don't have any ideas, you feel bad. I, I think it's and okay. The solution to, to that is ideas. you don't need any ideas to feel good. It's, it's not better. the ideas. It's not the ideas that's the source of the joy. Sure, sure. The joy is the source of the joy. Well. Let us say at this particular time, it was the liking or perhaps the satisfaction or the aha, right? So start looking for these ahas. Start recognizing that you can create them directly, that you don't have to sit around and hope and wait for an idea to pop into your head. That in fact, oh, the yeah, only idea you need to pop into your head is, hey, I can feel good without any ideas. Well, here's even one step further, even just realizing that ideas are a hindrance creates an aha of joy. That, yes, that just exactly. creates a little John a moment right there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly so. Yeah. Exactly. That we are not dependent upon ideas. And that, in fact, uh, what we're talking about is common in many different professions in the art world, especially designer art. Uh, writer's block, all of that kind of stuff. And people, when they don't have any ideas, they get really miserable. Sure. Which prevent them from having any ideas. If you had uh, uh, the idea of joy and you kept that going, the mind is going to come up with all kinds of really wholesome, wonderful, marvelous stuff. Sure. And you begin to really see the way things are because you're really looking closely. And so there's basically one aha after another, aha after another, aha. There's nothing but ahas. But in now the regards, it's not no longer mentally generated ideas, but rather it's mentally recognizing the reality of the situation is that things are quite marvelous. Sure. So here's an idea, pun intended. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> So let's say like you let's say so, for example, here's an idea that was useful for me today that I came up with. So I was thinking about writing my apology to my father, apologizing to my father. Right. Because I mm -hmm. talked to you about this. I haven't done it yet. And I had an idea that I was thinking one idea was to just write him a letter apologizing, just an apology letter. But another idea I had today was what I could do is just write him a letter saying, Dad, I'd like to apologize to you on the phone. You know, would you please uh, give me a call or can we please talk on the phone sometime so I can it'd be nice to hear your voice. It'd be nice to apologize to you over the phone, you know, for this. And I, you know, et cetera. And, and, and here's so anyway, an idea I, for you. But, but here is the oh, wait, but here's the point that I'm this is just a little example I was using. But the reason I brought this up is in the formal meditation, I should just be meditating. But when I decide, OK, I'm going to think about now my father and apologizing to him outside of the formal meditation. I'm just going to sit in a chair in front of my computer. I'm just going to think about this for 10 minutes. And that's when I'll actually think about that. But when I'm out there actually, in the yard sitting no. under the tree, don't just do the love every moment thing. You know? Well, so, let's go yeah. one step further. 
And that is sitting in a chair and thinking about apologizing to your dad is still not doing it. What you actually need to do is to write an email of apology to him and don't send it. But go ahead and write it down. Once you've got it written down, walk away from it and don't spend any more time about it. Have that as one of those kind of uh, thoughts that you put on the do list. So you don't do New York and you don't do dad. Once you get the email written. OK, and then the next day you go back and you sit down and you reread the email and you may want to edit it. So you edit it again. And then you don't send it. Mm. So but you take uh, it and keep uh, it out of your mind so that now all day long on the second day, no thoughts of emails, no thoughts of dad and no thoughts of New York. Sure. Let's sure. stay on the island. Let's sure, be sure. here. So it's okay. not about actually thinking. It's about actually doing it. So when, when you have something that you would normally think about, don't think about it. Just don't think just about it. Go do what do you're it. doing right now. And when you do that thing, you can then think about it while you're doing it at the same time, which is just doing it, basically. Because you're you doing know? it. Not only that, but if you're doing it correctly, you feel great doing it which was the next thing. If you start into that email and you start feeling bad about it, then stop and walk away and get it out of the mind, get New York out of the mind, get dad out of the mind, get emails out of the mind and get yourself back into a really pleasant state. Be on the island, be here now, get yourself, you know, go take a dog walk and whatever and come back later and then put the mind on the email when you're in a really good state. Sure. Sure. So, okay, that's all great. Thank you for that. So, well, um, this is one... the normal teaching. Do what you're going to do with all your mind, heart, and soul, and do it right, and feel good about what it's doing. And when you're finished with it, be finished. Sure. 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 That's so... the point. That that uh, most people, when they're doing something, they want to be doing something else. That's why they call what they're doing now work. Sure. But then they so, go do something else and they don't want to do it. They want to stop doing this. And this is now work. Let me go do something else. And they're never satisfied. And in our practice, we don't do what we're doing and become satisfied while we're doing. We get away from it all first and work 100% completely in seclusion to get the mind into a state that we can do anything. Sure. We can do anything. We can do that email. It's a piece of cake. And then we sit down and rewrite the email, but we don't mail it. <laughs> we keep it for review. Eventually sure. it'll be, you'll feel good enough that now's the time to push the send button. Ha <laughs> ha, I got sure. it. <laughs> Sure. All right, so this is a whole different way of looking at things. This is the way, this is why the Buddhist teaching mm. is so radical, is the seclusion comes first. Mm. After the seclusion comes the joy. After the joy comes the attitude, and after the attitude comes the action. Mm. And yet in the way that, of the world, act first, learn later. Mm. Shoot first, ask questions later. Mm. So All it's right. seclusion, uh, attitude, action. That's the, the way. Uh, Seclu okay. Yeah. Seclusion, uh, attitude, and then action. Once you get the attitude up. Now we can do this is what meta is really all about. Mm. Meta is dealing with other people when you've got the best attitude. But sure. you didn't get that attitude by messing with all those people. You got the right attitude by developing it in seclusion. Sure. And so, yeah, comment on that. So one thing that's been really interesting about yesterday and also today is, uh, is I noticed after all my time sitting, uh, after last night, I sat for you know two hours last night, and today I just felt such a single pointedness of mind carried throughout the entire day. 
and I sat another two hours and talking to you, you know, it's carrying through. It's just great. You know, just like when you do this, it just like carries through. It's like, uh, you know, I remember I talked to you. You remember it more often. You're paying attention. That's the whole point. I wouldn't say that it carries through. I would say that the skill is there in yet this moment, too. And then the skill is there in yet this moment, too. We're developing the skill, and here it is. Right, right. Nothing is continuing, though. (laughs) Right, right. And, you know, I remember in one of your talks, or it might have been in one of our conversations, I remember you saying, like, eventually you just learn to do this and you just do it all the time, you know, and you just are constantly doing this all the time, you know, just watching your mind, watching, 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 correcting, doing the right thing again, you know, throwing out the hindrances again and again and again and again. And it just becomes mm-hmm. who you are. And and I was thinking, you know what it's like? It's like learning how to read, you know, like when you're a child, you don't know how to read, mm-hmm. you know, and then you figure it out, you know, through a very long and complicated process. And then suddenly you're reading everything as an adult. You're reading all the time. I'm reading right now in the corner of the screen. It says Damarato Happy Skyper. <laughs> you know, that's, you know <laughs> I can't yes. tell you how I learned how to do that, but I just do it, you know. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, that's the that's the skill that most uh, primary school teachers are good at, but they're not good at keeping the children happy while the children are learning how to do that. Right. Now, the next point is, is that they're only taught how to read words on paper and they're not taught how to read reality which is even deeper, more profound and difficult school to uh, to learn, is when all the text is written in uh, an alphabet that's natural. And believe me, in the natural world, there are a whole lot more letters than 26. Mm-hmm. And it seems that the more letters that an alphabet has, the more complicated that um, learning to read is. An example of that is is that uh, Thai has more than 40 characters. It's way up there, and it's got a lot of other little marks. And because of that, it's really difficult to learn to read Thai. But it can be done. Chinese, on the other hand, 10,000 characters, and that's just a start. Right. (laughs) Yeah, it's something else, Chinese. Okay, so the number of characters, well... You think Chinese is hard? Think about the, the the language of reality. Yeah, you know, it's uh, there are no characters. Um, well, there are, but we have to learn to recognize them without a teacher. We have to do that naturally on the inside, mm. which is basically noble right view. So long as we hold wrong views which has to do with the child, or if we hold ordinary right views, which is the preview of the parent, the authority, the one who sets the rules. So long as we're in either one of those camps, there is not much of a horizon or that people can't see very far. They can't see beyond the rules. They can't see beyond themselves. But with noble right view, that vista to reality can be completely opened up so that you can literally be here now. Because that's where we find reality, is in the here now. The only reality we can experience is the reality that's happening right here, right now. We cannot experience the reality that's happening in New York. Therefore, that reality does not exist. Yeah, and by and by trying to make it exist, all we're doing is having a mental um, concept going on, sure. which is not real. So being in reality is what we're practicing to be in it, and then to remember to be in it again, and maybe a flitter of to New York, and then we forget that and remember to come back and be here now. Right. This is this is the practice and that it's quite valuable uh, to develop that kind of sati. And so one of the ways of developing that kind of sati, again, is by using the breath. 
Why? Yeah. Because, and the Buddha talks about it, sati on the end breath, to remember to take a long, deep in breath. And the, to remember to take a long, deep out breath. If we can do that, we're in the here now twice every breath. Right. Available for all of the other senses and not get caught back up into over there, over yonder, which is all happening in the mental sense. And so basically what the Buddhist practice is, is by being in real sensory awareness, we're in reality. And when we're in concepts and ideas, we're in a constructed reality. Sure. Hey, I have a quick question about the sati and the breaths. I, mm -hmm. I just got to ask it so I don't we don't lose track. Um, so I notice that oftentimes the sati will disrupt for a split moment when I, I reach the end of the in breath or the end of the out breath. So before the breath turns into um, an in breath or turns into an out breath, it's, it's like the sati wants to disrupt a little bit and then I have to nurture it and just be like, no, just keep, keep going <laughs> here. But, but I wonder if you wondered if you had any thoughts about that. I've been meaning to ask you about that for a while. Yes. In fact, the right way um, normally, um, it depends upon the criteria. And in the criteria of uh, with Anapanasati, then we're going to have a longer gap between the last end of the out breath before the next in breath. As you said, that's a point in time when the mind can easily wander away, which means now that's the point in time we're going to be especially on vigil. Hmm. Is to keep the mind um, occupied correctly. Uh, and we can do that in the sense of after the sign we let it out. We can have that thought of, wow, this is so nice. Or finally I'm at rest or this is at home or something that feels really relaxing. And those are the thoughts that you want to have during that out breath in the beginning. Later, as we um, work with the breath and the thoughts, we'll have it so that as we breathe out, the mind will stop and it won't start back up again until the next in breath. And this is a way to practice so that the mind actually stops. This is the place where we begin to put the gaps between the wholesome thoughts. But in the beginning, we have to make sure that the, that the wholesome thoughts are there, even in that gap between the out breath and the in breath. Mm. So if we're, if we're working at a, um, uh, a fairly rapid rate of breathing, which would be, uh, well, let us say 442. 442 is 10, which means 16. So we're talking about six breaths a minute, or about 10 seconds for a breath. We would have four on the in breath, and then four on the out breath. And then for a count of two, we're going to make sure that those two counts are completely wholesome. And then we take in the in breath, going back to the sati, paying attention to the breath as you're breathing in with thoughts like, oh, isn't this so nice? And then on that out breath, it's letting it out, letting everything go. It's almost like using the out breath to clean house. <sighs> a sigh of letting go, a wholesome sigh. <sighs> And then we breathe in again. So this is a way of practicing. And the kind of thoughts that we have is, wow, this is so nice. Everything is OK. Everything is fine. And then we can have those kind of thoughts also of, wow, how nice this is. Or, wow, there's no place to go. Or, wow, this idea is, is that it's the end of all problems <laughs> no more problems 
So I, ideas are unwholesome, correct? The ideas keep us agitated often. Or another is that the idea is the result of the agitation. Or is part of the agitation. But sure. when we see it as a thought, there's a solution to the problem. That's when we grab it. Mm -hmm. So then um, here's another thing that I sometimes get carried away with in meditation um, is sometimes I'll start fantasizing about something and I'll just think about how great that thing is. You know, like it might be like, you know, oh, it'd be so great if this girl were my girlfriend or, you know, it'd be so great if I had, you know, this job or this whatever, you know, or this amount of money, you know, or something like that, you know. Um, and then I'll just like fixate on how great that would be for a while. And I don't do that that often, but sometimes it does come up, um, especially with like a, a girl that I fancy, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, there, um, yeah, there is and a certain very amount, nice. yeah. there is yeah. a certain amount of gratification to, uh, molesting the mind over things that we don't have. Wanting things that we don't have. Wouldn't it be nice if I had this, that, and the other thing? This is very, very common. Right. But it's also dangerous. And so when you're having those kind of thoughts and you're having that kind of joy that comes with those kind of thoughts, start asking yourself also or start looking for and start investigating what's the danger in that stuff reminiscing about and longing for the things that you don't have. Sure, and I have started doing that. Because for one thing, it keeps you from being satisfied with what you do have right now. It, it does. And, and guess what? What you have right now is reality. And those pleasant thoughts about the things that you don't have is not real. Sure. And it does create a certain amount of longing. You'll get even more satisfaction out of, hey, I don't want any of that stuff. Right. I'm perfectly content right now. Right. Yeah, it does create like uh, dissonance, you know, and it, it, it creates longing. You know, it, it can be fine. Like if you just acknowledge and you're upfront with yourself that this is just a fantasy and like well, just enjoy this for see, the moment. Now that you see the the benefit, now that you see the gratification, now that you see uh, the part of having those kind of thoughts that is pleasant, when you begin to look deeper, you will see that they have barbs, that there is dangers therein. And right. when you see that danger, You'll ha say, wait a minute, I can have more wholesome thoughts than this. Right. Right. And, and then and you, then you begin to start it. moving that bar, as we've talked about, by inspecting these thoughts and recognizing, yes, I do see the benefit in those thoughts, but I can also see the dangers in those thoughts. Let me work in a way to where I'm having thoughts that have even more benefit and even less danger. Right, which is the same story as with the ideas, where you can see the benefits, but you also see the danger of focusing on the problems as opposed to right, right now. When so. in fact, the benefit of having those ideas is, well, let's have a really good idea and get the benefit about that. And that is that ideas are not worthwhile because right. there's no problems to solve. Right. <laughs> Why should I yeah. think about the solution to a particular problem when it's not my problem? Right. Or let's have a really great fantasy, which is that I don't need any of those fantasies because the present yeah. moment is so perfect already. <laughs> exactly. Now, as yeah. you can imagine, I, I kind of learned that in the 1970s, in oh, the wow. days of the engineering. I mean, engineers engineer things. Right. right? Okay. And so... uh engineers that engineer a bunch of stuff have a whole lot more ideas than they can actually put into practice. Right. I have that problem too. I have so many yeah, ideas. 10,000 yeah. 10, 10, excellent ideas. One or two of them may or may not get implemented. Yeah, no. 
That's a huge problem for me. I have so many ideas that I end up never doing anything, you know? Okay. And, uh, it's very frustrating, yeah. Aha! Now you see the dangers in having all of those ideas. They're yeah. frustrating because we don't put them into practice. Right, right. Because you can't. There's just not enough time. And There's so then you not, have to select. And it doesn't and belong like, to do you select? anyway. You're having solutions to problems that don't belong to you. Right, right. I did that one time when I dreamt up a database. Oh, it was so marvelous. But it never got implemented. I don't remember what it was, but it was some fine thing then. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I have ideas like I have ideas about small things to big things, you know, whether it's like, oh, be nice to read this book, you know, or to listen to this sometime. That's a small idea, right? Like just a, something for me to do or like, oh, start this business, you know, or write this book. I have like 50 ideas for books I could write. You know, I have many ideas, you know, scattered around my phone, you know, <laughs> you All know, right. or so or here's an idea for you. You know, or here's an this. idea for you. Yeah. Here's an yeah. idea for you. You don't have to write a book. Yeah. You don't have to, yeah. don't have to write don't. any books. No, no, I, I don't. Yeah. Guess what? Most people don't, and they're miserable because they didn't write a book. Guess what? You can be really, really happy because all of those books that you were told that you had to write, both by you and others, you don't have to write it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like you've said many times, there's already enough books. You know, there's, there's like enough more than books. you don't have to write way, another There's book. way too many, actually. There's <laughs> <laughs> not only is there enough, there's just too many. You know, no one can ever read them all. And so many of them are trash. You know, like there's a lot of bad books out there. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, the ones who, that are you know good, who makes the wrong, you know, who books. writes bad books? Uh, who? Every author's first one. Hmm. Yeah, I've, I've heard something like that before. I, I've also heard the first draft is always a garbage draft, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's very common, you know. Um, it's funny, though. That was one of my skills at university is I could write a good first draft, you know, and I could do it in a Guess short what? amount of time. You've got yeah. a new skill. What? <laughs> you don't have to. I don't have to. Yeah. You don't have to. Now that's a better skill. I, it is. It is. Yeah. That you yeah. don't have to write a book. Isn't that marvelous? It is. You'd be surprised at how many times I've heard you ought to write a book. And my answer's always been there's already enough books. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're right. There's a lot. And you're already contributing a lot with your YouTube channel. You know, like that's more than enough. You know, it's, it's enough a very already. unique. It's a very unique YouTube channel. I don't know of any others like it. You know, it, it's great. So I think that's worth more than all the those books out there that are rather similar to each other. <laughs> you know. OK, so we can look at that then. This is, in yeah. fact, uh, we can uh, entitle this video a good idea. OK, cool. It's a nice yeah. title. I like it. A good, yeah. a good idea is that we don't have to have good ideas. We can be happy without good ideas. The good ideas don't make us happy. Sure. So we've looked at two sides of it. One is, is that we have an idea and we apply it and it didn't work. But then we looked at the fact that we've got whole bunches of ideas that never get applied. And so we don't even know whether they work or not. But every time we have that good idea, oh, I had a good idea. Oh, and am I marvelous or what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. And, and, and you end up collecting all this pointless stuff, too. Like I have all these books that I'll never get to read, you know, because <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just think, oh, that'd be great to read that someday. And I'll go buy it, you know. <laughs> Uh huh. You know, and or, now or you can look at that book and say, "Guess what? I don't have to ever read that. I don't have to read it. I don't have to." Yeah, you know, have you ever heard of Umberto Eco's anti-library? No. So he had Umberto Eco. You know, he died a few years ago. He's famous philosopher. He had what he called an anti-library, which was a library in his ha house of books that he had never read. <laughs> 
and it was specifically for books that he had never read. And when when they were read, he would move it from the anti library to the library. Oh, but, well, he's got everything backwards. <laughs> Because once you've read a book, you'll never read it again. Or you shouldn't. I mean, if it and if you do read it and read it and read it, then it doesn't belong in the library. It belongs on your bed stand or uh, on your bed. But basically, all the libraries of the world are filled with books that nobody reads. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's a shame. And so a library is, in fact, the books that nobody reads. Once a book yeah. is read, it comes out of the library, and now it's a good book. If you keep reading it, if you stop reading it, then it can go back into the library. The library is the place where you kept unread books, unread books. Well, it's funny because you could almost say the reason we have libraries is to be like a homage to the people who had, had enough chutzpah to go write their own book. Because the vast majority of those books are not going to be read. Oh, gosh. And I thought we put all those books in the library because we didn't want them in the landfill. (laughs) (laughs) Pollutes our landfill with all them books. Well, that's one way of looking at it. (laughs) 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 And and actually, this is another topic uh, related is I've found I often will find like a very positive way of looking at something, you know, and and I don't know if that is always like the right way to look at, like, for example, what I just said, it's a, like a library is a homage, you know, to all the people that have the courage to write a book, you know, even though many of those books will never get read. That's a very wholesome, happy point of view, but yeah, I don't think it's really right per se, Yeah, you know, but it's like a wholesome view. So what are your thoughts and kind of, having wholesome, happy views of things that aren't necessarily accurate. A little bit further investigation and you can have wholesome, happy thoughts that are accurate. Hmm. That they're not mutually exclusive, you know. Right. And I think one other thing I'm thinking about in my own life is like, for example, Um, I might, let's say I'm spending too much money, right? And, and my dad might criticize me for that. Oh, you're spending too much money, you know, yada, yada, yada. And then I will have the, the, the lion's attitude of, you know what? I can spend this money now because I know I'll be able to, 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 to survive no matter what, like, it doesn't matter whatever happens. If I have to live more humbly later, you know, that's fine because I just need to do this right now and I don't really care, you know. Um, and and so it's this very positive attitude of nothing can stop me, I'll be fine, you know. But it is maybe wiser to think the way my father is of, oh, I should reduce my spending, you know, for future sustainability for whatever reasons. I have more savings, et cetera. So I was about even to mention though, that exactly. And yeah. also uh, causing you what we've talked about before, that in fact, if your dad says don't spend so much money, you're automatically going to rebel against that. Right. I mean, you're the, quite the rebel, just like he is. Yeah, yeah. It runs and the, so he's yeah, rebelling but... against society and telling you don't spend money. And here you are rebelling against his good advice. To where the Buddha would talk about it in the sense of the four requisites. Now, the four requisites, uh, there's a uh, quite a lot about them in Sutta number two in the Asaba Asaba Sutta uh, under the label of uh, taints that are be to be destroyed by using, as opposed to taints that are to be destroyed by avoiding. Some things you avoid and some things you don't avoid. Okay. Uh, For instance, it's a whole lot easier for someone to quit smoking or to quit drinking because they don't need that at all. But it's very difficult for someone to go on a diet because they can't quit eating. Sure. Right. Okay. So now that we've established that. Pardon? Unless they're a Jane. Well, that's got nothing to do with it. I don't know where that's going. But anyway, uh, the four requisites 
is adequate housing, adequate clothing, adequate food, and adequate medical attention. Now, it's quite possible for people to live, but it's not good living if they have to do without one or the other of them. For instance, children go to bed hungry. Others go to bed on the street because they've got no housing. But the Buddha would recommend that we have to have at least adequate housing, which would be a hut in the woods, adequate food. But that's all that we need and that we're looking at it in the sense of the, uh, let us say, the more powerful and and, uh, refined the mind is, the more unified the mind is and the more um, confidence one has then that means that our bottom line will go down. So that we what used to be adequate now becomes luxurious. And we can come down to a level of adequacy. Okay, this is a way of of practice of in the sense of how frugal can you get? Well, it's funny, Charlie, can you be? Well, society will say the opposite, which is the more confident you are, the higher your standard will be because you'll think you're the king. And so you deserve the highest. I thought that we had discussed society's problems already. Yes. In fact, that is the lie. They want you to consume everything that you've um, uh, produced so that you will produce more because they get a cut. Right. Right. Okay. Who gets a cut? Often the religions get a cut. Often the government gets a cut. Business gets a cut. Everybody gets a cut of the laborer's uh, labor. That in fact, everybody gets so much of a cut that the laborer is kind of left without. So if he's if he's worth fifty dollars an hour, he may get paid fifteen. And all of these other people take their cut. That's why they keep wanting him to work. That's why they want him to spend his money. Sure. So they want it. So to go back to the earlier point about if your mind is really refined, your your level, your standard you'll accept goes down as opposed to up. So uh, so I would imagine the reason for that would be is you feel you can handle anything. So you might as well be economical because there's no reason to be, you know, extravagant. It's just not logical to be extravagant. If you don't need it, don't buy it. Right. Right. Which is honestly like one of the worst things about living in New York is like you you just feel like this need to buy things all the time. You know, so many people that live there have that. I have a friend who visits sometimes. I think I've told you this before. He said like every time he visits, he feels like a vacuum cleaner gets attached to his wallet. You know, like that that city just really makes you want to spend money. I've never... Mm -hmm experienced anything like it you know it's it's there's a slight mistake in there that vacuum cleaner is not attached to his wallet it's attached to his mind yeah yeah (laughs) and i'm not sure that it's a vacuum i think then what it's doing is is it's force feeding greed into the mind right 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 and yeah so you know, I'm curious about this this mystery of nature and why it is it seems to be the case that when I'm in nature, I will just spontaneously, you know, have solutions to problems. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, <laughs> you know. Um, um, for one thing, the, the solutions were already there, but when you make room for them in the mind, they will kind of pop up. Right. Scientists right, know right. about this for a long time, known about it, that if you've got a particular problem on your mind, you're not going to solve it. But if you get away from it, the solution, which was clear and obvious, so obvious that it was like, dang, why couldn't I have thought about that yesterday? The answer is because you were searching for it. And like a mouse is going to hide from the cat. Right, right. The best way for a cat to catch a mouse is just to sit still and watch. And when the mouse comes out, you pounce. Well, yeah, this is one of the amazing things about being out here is I just feel so much more clear headed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a really big difference. Well, we can go back to the fact that much of the rumble of New York 
is not rumble of the tires and the friction of the pavement. The rumble yeah. is, in fact, a noise of the mind. And when you have a whole lot of minds collected together, each one of them shouting in rage, anger, frustration, et cetera, like that, it becomes kind of a cacophony of need. Right. And when you're away from all of those people, it begins to feel really easy. Yeah, yeah, totally. The whole, it, it's called a vibe. You can yeah. experience it. I don't know where it is in uh, as far as in the electromagnetic spectrum. That right. I'm not sure about. But the human body picks that stuff up, just like your friend says, is that it feels like when he walks into New York, that he's in the atmosphere that has the um, uh, uh, the idea of the sensation of having a vacuum cleaner attached to his wallet. Right. But if right. it looks a little bit differently, it's actually a feeling of tension and anxiety that we have been trained that we can relieve that by spending money and buying something. We buy something to relieve us of the tensions of being in the city. Right. Right. Everybody's in a hurry. Everybody is anxious. Everybody is uptight. Everybody's looking for something. Right. And that that um, those vibes, uh, uh, they rub off to every country bumpkin. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, it's yeah, it's really something. And well, do you now, know it? I mean, now because you've you've experienced that. So yeah. now that you know the distinction, you have a choice. Are you going to return to New York knowing that it's got that vibe to it? Or are you going to look for places that are, are, are more conducive to mental health? Well, the way I'm feeling right now is I don't want to go back there at all. Okay. You know, and, well, and, enjoy where you are then. Just yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. And, you know, that might change, but that's how I feel right now. You know, is I do not want well, to go back might, there. And, you might get your mind into such a great, wonderful shape that you can take on the world. You can even handle New York. Yeah. I can yeah. take our New York. Let me have it. Yeah. You know, OK, yeah. well, go, go get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but be careful to keep that attitude because you may get there and find out that this place is a little bit bigger than you thought it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about the Big Apple, you may take out more of a bite than you can chew. <laughs> right, right, yeah. But certainly don't go back because you've got to or because you need to. Go back with the attitude that I can handle that apple. Sure, sure. So, I, so another... Hater, Guess what? I don't yeah. have that attitude about New York even now. <laughs> I don't think I want to go bother. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good, good for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, kind of like a peaceful paradise here. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, it, so uh, another hindrance, you know, that has come up recently, um, and I love just going through all of these with you. This is really good fun for me. Um, is uh, is a little bit of loneliness, you know, like especially for the company of women, you know, um, in particular. So uh, that has been something that's come up, and I'm sure this is something a lot of monks deal with, you know. So I'd I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, especially you know desire for women, you know, et cetera, um, when in seclusion. Um, the first thing is is to recognize that thoughts, certain kinds of thoughts, bring up that longing, and when you feel that longing. You can actually deal with it directly once you feel it. If you're really sharp, you can see the thoughts before it brings up the longing. Mm. Okay. But once the longing is there with breathing and with wholesome thoughts, you can say, wow, right now I'm actually better off without one of those things. Sure. This very moment is good enough as it is without someone sure and come back to this present moment and recognize the longing was something that got started because of thoughts unwholesome thoughts brought up the longing what are those thoughts thoughts of wanting something you don't have right 
Great. And so when those thoughts of wanting something you don't have, they're going to bring up longing. You're going to feel incomplete, on whole. And when you catch that, you say, I don't have to feel that way. Great. If I'm practicing correctly, if I'm practicing right, then I can just take a deep breath and never mind. Everything's okay. I don't need that. Right. You know, and we can that... say there may be another time at another place when I get my act together, we'll deal with it. But right now, I'm better off right here. This is the right. place to be. And right. so having those kind of wholesome thoughts, this is OK. Everything is all right. Everything is fine. We'll deal with those kind of things later once the skills are fully developed. And right now I'm developing those skills by being able to put these kind of thoughts out of the mind. Sure. Sure. And yeah, you know, and, and it's interesting because I do have a few girls that I'm, you know, in contact with and, you know, interested in, but, but, you know, they're quite far away at the moment. <laughs> and well, uh, have and you I told what that one of the yeah. things that you might want to do then is either there's two ways to handle it. One is just to turn off the email and don't look at any emails or any yeah. incoming or any social medias or anything like that. And the right. other option, which is a little bit more chicken, is to tell them that you're on retreat. Sure. But the right thing to do is just go do what you were going to do. Get away from it all. Don't look at yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah, just, just forget, just, it. Just just forget text, about it. You know, yeah, if they text, I respond. But other than that, just let it, you know, let it, let it go. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, it's hard, though, to do that. Like, as I say that. No, it's not hard. It's only hard for a victim. Mm -hmm. And you're not a victim. You're the winner here. You're the one right. who owns those fingers that punch those keys to get up the emails. Right. You're the boss here. You can say, no, I don't want nothing to do with that kind of stuff right now. I'm going to have my retreat. Sure, sure. Mm. And so putting it, putting that stuff aside, don't go there. Don't oh, go okay. to New York. Don't go to dad. Stay away from all of that stuff. Recognize that those are unwholesome thoughts. And that the kind of wholesome thoughts you want to have is, wow, how nice it is right now without any of that. No place to go, no work to do. Now, that one's a really nice one. I really like that one when I recognize, gosh, I don't have any responsibilities. No right. one is making any demands upon me at all. Now, That's if I go write one. that girlfriend an email, now I've got responsibility. She may write back. And then what right. am I going to do? Right. Right. But the reality is, is that she's not writing to me and I'm not writing to her, so I don't have to worry about it. Everything's OK. I got no problems. I got no place to go and nothing to do. No responsibilities. Isn't that so marvelous? Sure, sure. Totally. Yeah, and that that's actually the point about the writing people. I love to write people. I love to send texts and this and that. Guess what? You and can also love not writing people. Yeah, yeah. I, I should really pull back on that, you know, like because it, it does bring me out of the moment to do it. And um, and it's just something I just like to do. But I think I can just, you know, step back on that, you know, and just enjoy the moment more for sure. Yeah. Let your seclusion be real seclusion for a while. Right, four, right. Four months. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. And here's another funny thing is like another little internal contradiction. And I feel like I already even know the answer, just what you'll say, but just worth bringing up. Why not? Is is I feel like, uh, you know, like financially and also to not burden my mom, you know, it's a good idea to apply for jobs. But I really don't want to do that. I really don't want to do that, you know. <laughs> So just don't in do what it. Way, in what way are you burdening your mom other than groceries? Um, no other way. <laughs> just just like I maybe the mental burden of me being here, you know. 
Um, I don't know if that's the well, burden. Well, she's for going her. to have that mental burden no matter where you are or what you're doing. Yeah, that's true. But if she knows that you're well off and comfortable and happy, that will take a load off of her mind. And it doesn't mean that she sees that you're well employed because well employed does not mean well off. Sure. And so being well off, being happy, being content is all your mom needs. That's the payback is be successful at this. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. Yeah, well, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, in fact, you could say that you owe it to her. I really felt that way, that I owed it to Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa. He cared so much about me, and Achan Po cared so much about me that I felt obligated. I've got to do this. Right, right. So you could use yeah, her so. mom as part of that, that she's given you the place to stay, and everything is marvelous for that. Pay her back by getting good benefit out of your stay. Sure, sure. So my mom did ask, so she asked me on Sunday, oh, have you started applying for jobs yet? And I said, mom, I'm uh, I'm just kind of on vacation right now. And she was like, OK, you know, how about tomorrow? And I said, you know, OK, maybe I can do that. And so I applied for a few today, you know, and it takes a while to hear back and all this. It's not something that, you know, but maybe I should go to her and say, you know, mom, I think I'm just going to you know, go on retreat now for a little while. No, and see what she says. It, you don't Start have to like do to any do of that. Okay. You don't have to do that. You can just be on retreat and let her have what she's going to have. You just be on retreat. Mm -hmm. So, so just say to her, like, uh, if she asks, yeah, mom, I'm applying. <laughs> Everything is all right. Everything's okay. fine. It's taken care of. Don't worry a thing, Mom. Everything's okay. Yeah, I, I know how she is, though. She'll start asking questions like, oh, have you heard from anyone or this or that, you know, and, um, you know, heard from any companies and get any interviews, you know, she'll start asking. And all she like wants that. is reassurance, and all you have to do is give her reassurance. Everything's okay. Everything's fine. Yeah. It's going to work out just fine, Mom. Hmm. Cool. You do like not it. have to buy her worry. She's out there selling worry, isn't she? She's been yes. selling you that kind of worry for many, many years. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you can give her back some reassurance. Everything's okay, Mom. We'll take care of it. Get that done. You don't have to worry about a thing. Sure. We got sure. everything that we need. Sure. Not lie to her. Don't lie to her. But reassure her everything's fine. Right. I like it. <laughs> cool. Because guess what? Everything really is fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She totally. hasn't figured that out yet. She right. thinks things. She thinks things won't be fine until you get a job. Right. Right. Okay. And so she had to be reassured. Everything is fine. Everything's okay. Not a problem in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So cool. So I'm thinking of, <laughs> um, of uh, you know, just setting my phone down, you know, and just. You know, not just using it. Literally you know, just hanging out. Just go enjoy your life. Yeah. Be in the present moment and just find so much joy. Go play with the dog. Go scratch the dog. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do that. We, we go for our long walks. You know, I listen to music and we just have a great time, you know. And it's it's and, and, great. And stay command. out of New York. Stay yeah. out of New York. Right, right, right. And, um, yeah, you know, I might have to go into Seattle uh, for just a few days in August, but it's just a few days. You know, it's not the end of the world, um, but it's it's in several weeks. So 
Doesn't well, we'll, matter. We'll talk later about that. Never mind. Yeah. We'll go ahead and finish off now, and we'll talk <laughs> to you later. All right. That sounds good. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It's been a great one. It's been one of my favorites in, in a while. So uh, we cover, we covered a lot of ground. So I so thank you very much. We did not go yeah. anywhere. That's the oh, whole point. We covered absolutely no <laughs> ground. We didn't go any place. <laughs> True that. True that. That's, did, did that's nothing. The truth. That's that's the that's the Buddha's truth right there. <laughs> okay. Right. See you later. Right. Cap, Cap. See you later. All right.